the wars being added to a lot of our fishing on Lake Gaspin, uh, but it can apply to fishing in the river as well. I'll start with the rods I use. Um, all my rods are medium heavy, big cat fever. Uh, it's seven and a half foot, it's really nice action, and they can handle up to 12 ounces of weight without a problem. Anything after that, uh, they have a heavy action rod that's a little more well suited for situations with that heavy weight. Uh, my reels, I use a variety of different reels right now. Uh, this is the Abu Garcia 6500. I've got a few accurates and uh, truth reels. And all of them do a, a great job. Uh, there's plenty of options out there of good manufacturers. As, as long as you get something that can handle the power and weight of those big blue cats without falling apart on it. Um, that's really all that matters. You want something that will hold a decent amount of uh, 20 or 30 pound line or more. So these hold about, you know, 150, 200 yards of uh, 30 pound big game uh, filament, which is basically all I use. Uh, I do have one rig with braid, uh, 80 pound braid, and that's mainly just for uh, fishing with these slip bobber rigs. Um, with braid having a smaller diameter, 80 pound braid, you know, it'll measure out about the same as, uh, you know, 25 or 30 pound monofilament. So it still holds a few hundred yards of, uh, of line. Uh, the rigs I use, uh, you know, if I'm anchor fishing, I just use a basic Carolina rig. In the lake, a three ounce egg sinker. Uh, I, I like these ball chain swivels that just help with the leader twisting up. Um, I use 60 pound monofilament leader on all my rigs and 9 aught and 10 aught Charlie Brown circle hooks. If you're fishing, you know, in the lake, uh, 30 ounces of weight is usually going to be plenty. And another thing is I always put a bead between the weight and the knot and that just cushions the knot. If that weight's sliding up and down all day, you know, it can take a toll on your knot without having something to cushion it. If you're fishing somewhere such as the James River, you know, using using heavier weight, and this is my go-to rig for out there. Still a Carolina rig, but there's uh, 12 ounces of weight on a sinker slider, and still, of course, have the bead there to cushion the knot. And everything else is the same as far as the leader material and hook. Did you say your length of leader? Yeah, the length of the leader, um, generally, is, it's gonna be anywhere from 12 to 24 inches. Uh, if I'm fishing a lot of current, I've got to be, you know, more towards 12 to 16 inches or so. But if I'm fishing in the lake, especially with the drift rig, with the float on the leader, that's when I go to a longer leader to, to you know, to float that bait up off the bottom. <clears throat> uh, being that I do a lot of, you know, fishing in the lake, as I was saying, this is probably my most used um, rig on the boat. It's a three-way drift rig. And uh, you know, the leader material, everything's the same as far as that goes. I've still got a, a ball chain swivel up here. But what I've done is you know, I've tied a lighter uh, monofilament leader going through my weight. And what that does is if something, if, you know, if my weight gets snagged on something, um, most of the time I'll just break the weight off and I'll still get my hook and my swivel and everything back. And these weights, they're just homemade uh, snagless sinkers. Uh, this is actually just a shoestring filled with buckshot. It's about two ounces of weight. Uh, I don't, when I'm drift fishing, I don't use anything more than about two ounces. Uh, sometimes I might only run an ounce, especially if I'm running planer boards to help pull my baits out to the side. They don't do very well with anything more than a half ounce and a half of weight most of the time. So essentially it's you know, the same thing as the Carolina rig, which is the most basic rig, but you just have an extra line going down to your weight. Like I said, my main line is 30 pound monofilament, and I'm usually using uh, 15 pound for my weight leader, so there's no trouble uh, just breaking that weight off and getting everything else back uh, if needed. All my hooks are 9 aught and 10 aught uh, Charlie Brown circle hooks. And they're made by Bobby Willow's tackle. Now this is referred to as a Santee rig most places. Same as a 
Carolina rig, but just with the float on the leader. Uh, I like using these if I'm anchor fishing, but I'm in an area that's got a lot of grass or debris on the bottom. You know, this will just help raise that bait up off the bottom. And, uh, you know, I still run three ounces of weight, uh, easy to cast, and it'll, it'll hold fine on the bottom. Um, I don't like using the three-way drift rigs when I'm anchor fishing just because the way they're designed is, is really more for drifting and moving, um, you know, to, to keep that line pulling out straight. So I don't like using a lot for anchor fishing. Uh, I prefer to use a Santee rig if I need to get my bait off the bottom while anchor. Uh, one of my all-time favorite rigs is a slip bobber. And I do mine a little bit different. Uh, you know, in a traditional slip barber setup. A lot of people just run a Carolina rig under the bobber. And what I do is actually run a three-way drift rig under the bobber. And what that will allow me to do is say I'm fishing in 40 or 50 foot of water and I have my slip barber set 25 foot. And I see a flat or a point coming up that I think might have some fish on it. I want to drift over that area as well. Well, when I drift up on that flat or point, if I had a traditional Carolina rig, that hook would just drag across the bottom and most likely get snagged up or pick up grass. And uh, that's not a good way to catch fish. So it's just a way to keep, you know, to, to keep lines in the water more and, you know, cover more water. Instead of having to reel up these barbers, I'll leave them out and drift through that shallow water. What happens is that weight will bounce along the bottom and the hook will stay up here. Uh, as you can see, I, I run a longer leader to my weight on this rig since I don't have a float on the actual leader. Um, but yeah, that snaggles weight will usually go right over that flat and the bait will stay up about a foot or so off the bottom. I don't have much trouble getting snagged that way. And when I drop back off into deeper water, wherever I have the depth set on a slip bobber, uh, that's where I'll be fishing again. So if I drift over a flat that's maybe 10 foot deep, I have this bobber set 25 foot, uh, it'll just drag across the bottom with the bait, you know, just, just off the bottom enough not to get snagged. As soon as I drop back off into the deeper water, I'm, you know, I'm fishing suspended again. Uh, the, the way that you set your depth on these slip bobbers is not like a traditional bobber where you clip the bobber on the line and that's how deep you're fishing. Uh, the slip bobber, it slips up and down the line and there's a stopper you put on at the depth that you want to fish. And when you cast that, you know, the line will go through the bobber, it'll you know, just slide up the line, the bobber will slide up the line until that stopper hits the top of the bobber. And I use rubber bobber stopper. I don't know if you can see them, but I've actually got them reeled on to the reel right now. They're super, you know, easy to use, inexpensive. You can get them off uh, Amazon and eBay. A lot of stores don't have them in their appropriate size because uh, you, you do want to make sure you get the, the size stoppers that are rated for the line you're using. So personally, being that I use 30 pound bottle filament, 80 pound braid, uh, I get the bobber stoppers that are rated for 30 to 50 pound mono, and they work well on the 80 pound braid and the 30 pound mono. As far as uh, catching bait, you know, Lake Gaston is, is known for being a hard body of water to catch uh, gizzard shad, and being that gizzard shad is one of my favorite baits, you know, that makes things a little bit complicated. Uh, when I can find them in Gaston, I use an 8 foot and 10 foot cast net, a half inch mesh size, and a pound and a half of weight per foot. So they're uh, fairly heavy cast nets uh, made by a brand called Bait Buster. Um, you know, best price that, I, that I've found for a net, you know, of that caliber that has that heavy weight and, and really high quality mesh. Um, you know, somewhere like the James River, you can get a gill net license. Uh, they're not very expensive, easy to get. And you can set a gill net and usually pick up uh, gizzard chat fairly easily if you have a general idea of where they are. Um, and you can also use a cast net in the James River. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's, it's easier to just throw the net a couple times, especially in the warmer months, uh, when you don't mind, you know, getting a little bit wet out there and throw the cast net and pick up some bait. Uh, but on Gaston, you know, in North Carolina, you're not allowed to use gill nets. So we're, we're stuck with uh, cast nets and using rod and reel. Uh, when I'm using rod and reel, I mainly target bluegill and white perch. 
and I'm using sabiki rigs. Uh, some of you probably have seen these, often used for saltwater fishing, uh, for catching bait in saltwater. But these are a really valuable tool uh, for catching bait uh, where I fish. It's just a two ounce weight on the bottom, and most sabiki rigs have either four, five, or six hooks. And I've seen many times where every single hook caught a bait fish, you know, whether it be a white perch or, or something else. But um, we tip the hooks with a little bit of night crawler or minnow, uh, sometimes thread pin shad, just little small pieces all you need. You can catch, you know, bait without any type of uh, additional bait added on to the lure, uh, but it just helps to, to have something with a little bit of scent to it, a little extra flash to get, get more attention from uh, white perch or bluegill or whatever else you're targeting. As far as finding white perch um, or bluegill, you know, in the summer, bluegill are extremely easy to find. They're always up against the bank in gas plant. You can just go and, you know, cast up against the bank with maybe a little small bobber. Um, you know, normally, if I'm doing that, I won't be using this deep rig. I'll just fish a you know, more traditional way with a small hook and a bobber set a couple of foot deep. Uh, but if I can get white perch, I prefer them uh, over bluegill. And in the summer, you'll find those a lot of times about 15 to 20 foot deep in Lake Gaston. And you can mark them pretty easily on your sonar. A lot of times they'll be in creeks, and uh, we'll see them on the bottom uh, schooled up. And you can just drop these down and I mean, it's, it's honestly a lot of fun, too, to, to sit here and catch five or six white perch at a time. I don't care how old you are or how many big fish you caught. Uh, catching, catching bait's always fun, too. <laughs> what size bluegill or perch do you prefer? Um, I like to have a mix of different <coughs> size baits. You know, generally, the white perch we're catching at bluegill. Uh, they might be, you know, five or six inches. Just smaller ones, you know, you might catch a few eight or nine inches long. Uh, if they're small, smaller size, that's what I prefer to use live, or I might just cut the fins off and throw it out whole um, as a dead bait. And when they get a little bit bigger, I like to cut them in half or cut them into three pieces. Uh, if I can get gizzard shad, you know, overall, that's probably my overall favorite bait. And like I said, on Lake Gaston, well, that can be pretty challenging to find though. It's not really a good population of grizzly shad in that lake. Uh, now, Kerr Lake, uh, you can go out there and find them. You can't use a gill nut, uh, but you can catch them in a cast nut. They're usually around creek bridges and around docks. And you just gotta go out there and kind of throw, throw your net until you find them. And generally, once you find places that they hold, you can go back and catch them again in that area. Uh, this time of year, you know, Everything's moving a little deeper with the water temperature dropping. So a lot of times I'll catch my white perch uh, 40, 45 foot, sometimes 50 foot deep. Uh, they do get extremely stacked up when the water temperature drops down below 50 or so. Uh, and the same applies in the summer. The summer with the water really warm, they also get you know tightly schooled up. Uh, and so summer and winter, easiest time to catch white perch in my opinion. Uh, spring and fall, with the water kind of in a, a medium temperature, the fish, everything are transitioning, so that can make it a little more difficult to find a tight school of bait. Uh, you know, this time of year, I can usually go out, drop that sabiki rig, and catch bait in a couple hours, no problem. As far as, um, you know, live bait versus cut bait, uh, I'm not going to say that one is better than the other. You know, I've seen days where they wouldn't even bite cut bait and all they wanted was live bait. Uh, other days, they wouldn't touch a live bait, they just wanted to cut bait. So uh, my, my general rule of thumb is just mix it up as much as possible. Uh, same with the size of the bait you're using. You know, if I'm using cut bait, I might take uh, one or two and throw them out whole. Uh, I might take another one and, and cut it into small chunks, and then I might take another one and even fillet it up uh, into big fillets. And just little things like that can make a big difference. You know, some days you just get keyed in on one particular thing, and that's the only way that you're going to catch many fish. Uh, same with, you know, the different rigs. You know, I try to mix that up, and the reason for that is it's the same thing. They get keyed in on certain things on any given day, it can change. Uh, so I always keep at least one or two slip bobber rigs out for that reason. Um, 
you know, summertime, especially, fish uh, get really suspended. A lot of times, you know, in a body of water that has low oxygen, like Lake Gaston, uh, being that it, it does have low oxygen, uh, around June or July, when the water temperature gets around 80 degrees or more, there's a thermocline that's established, and that's just a layer of the water that's got cooler water and more oxygen. And when that happens, you're going to have more bait concentrated in that depth, and you're also going to have the bigger fish right there with them. So that's an exceptional time to use these slip bobber rigs, um, but they're also, you know, extremely effective in the winter time, fall, spring, all year round. Um, last winter, you know, I, I fished a couple days where there was ice on the water. Couldn't even get a bite on the bottom, and the slip bobber rig was catching fish every cast. So uh, you just really never know. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you why they do that in the winter time, but some days they just you know, suspend over that deep water. You might be in 60 foot of water, but the fish are only 20 or 30 foot down. Uh, so, like I said, the best thing to do is always cover as many bases as possible and, and keep a variety of different uh, baits and rigs out. And, you know, if you start seeing that they're biting on that particular bait or rig, then you can start switching the other ones over to that for that particular day. Uh, you can key in on what they're doing. As far as the types of structure that I fish, uh, you know, I stick to uh, a lot of humps, uh, you know, creek channels, main lake channels. Uh, this lake, I mean, this map of the lake here, it doesn't have any extreme detail, but uh, I, mean, I could just give you a general idea. Say uh, down here around Pea Hill Creek, um, there's a nice deep channel that you know goes all the way back through through the creek. And what I would you know generally look for is some type of hump or ledge, uh, whether it be the channel ledge or any other type of drop off, uh, those blue cats are usually gonna be using those to ambush bait fish. Uh, the, the reason I stick to the channel is because the fish use those basically the way we use highways. You know, if they're gonna, if they're gonna migrate and move somewhere, or whether it be the bait fish or the, the larger fish, uh, they're generally gonna use those channels to do that. Uh, so I, I always try to stay kind of close to some kind of channel. Uh, you know, a lot of times a flat right beside a channel will hold a lot of good fish, uh, but a flat that's, you know, way off by itself uh, usually won't have too much going on from what I've seen. Being that I do a lot of drift fishing, you know, that the point of drift fishing in the lake is to cover as much structure and, and just cover as much water as possible. Uh, being that the lake doesn't have a lot of current, such as places as the James River, you can't really find just one particular hole and, um, and kind of key in on, on a specific fish like that. It's better to just cover as much open water as you can, cover as much structure as you can, and you'll stand a better chance to pretty your bait in front of some active fish. Uh, so I do a lot of trolling with my trolling motor. Uh, the key to that is keeping your speed around a half a mile an hour or less. If you can catch fish going faster, you know, it's not a, a set in stone type of thing, but I think generally speaking that you'll catch more larger fish if you're uh, keeping that speed at a nice, uh, slow pace. So, uh, you know, half a mile an hour or less is, is pretty good year round. The water temperature drops down into the mid to lower 40s or even cooler than that. Uh, I'll still do some drift fishing, but I'll usually keep my um, my speed even slower. I might go 0.2 or 0.3 miles per hour. Uh, but my thing is, you know, if I'm using my trolling motor to drift fish, I'm not going to get right in the middle of this creek and just stay in the middle, you know, and go into the creek. I'm going to zigzag back and forth. Now, the reason for that is, if you're just going straight down the middle of that creek, there's a better chance all you're going to be doing is staying in the channel. Um, you know, you're not going to really be going up and down a lot of ledges, and you're not going to be covering as much structure. If you're going say from uh, one bank, you know, to this other bank and then back to that bank, naturally you're just covering more water and putting your bait in front of more fish. Um, now, really windy days, you know, things are a little bit different. Uh, you can't really try to fight the wind with the trolling motor. It never works. I've tried to do it a lot of times and it's just a major headache. Uh, that's when you need at least one, but preferably two drift socks, depending on the situation. Personally, I use uh, six foot and 10 foot East Wind drift socks. As far as I know, they're the only company that makes a 10 foot drift sock. Uh, so that's really great for catfishermen because 
being that you want to have your speed around a half mile an hour or less. If the wind's blowing 10, 15, 20 miles per hour, um, there's really no way to slow your boat down without this. They also keep the boat straight and stop it from swaying around in a lot of wind or uh, weight from other boats coming by. Uh, so that's a really good tool to have. Uh, the thing is, the wind's blowing, you know, pretty strong one direction. You can't really do the zigzag drifting um, as I prefer to do. In that case, you just have to line up with the wind and just do, you know, I, what I usually do is, is shorter drifts. Um, being that I can't have complete control over where I'm going, I may drift uh, 100 or 150 yards of just one a particular type of structure I like, then have to reel everything up and move over to another area and do it again. So it's, you know, it's a little more aggravating, a little more work, um, but it's still a good way to catch fish. The main thing is just keeping control of the boat. Uh, so drift socks, always a great thing to have. They also can come in handy for anchor fishing somewhere like the James River where you have a lot of current pulling on your boat. Um, you know, when I anchor fish in the lake, I usually have to use three anchors. I use one off the front and two off uh, the back, and one off each corner of the back. And, you know, the reason for that being with no current or anything pulling the boat straight, it'll just sit there and sway back and forth if there's any, even just a little breeze or another boat coming by, uh, the lines will just be slack and baits will be pulling across the bottom. Um, so anchoring in the lake's a little bit more difficult. A lot of times I'll put out my front anchor, it's a Danforth anchor. Um, this traditional style anchor. I'll print that out. It's got eight foot of chain, um, and that chain just helps helps the anchor lay down and dig in better. And I might let out, say I'm, I'm anchoring in, um, you know, 20 foot of water. I'll go ahead and lay out a 100 foot of anchor rope or more on the front. And that just helps keep that angle on the anchor right to where if the boat's you know, rocking up and down in it, it's not constantly bouncing that anchor up and down off the bottom. A lot of people have trouble because they try to anchor with the anchor straight under the boat. And any, if you do that anytime your boat starts rocking up and down, the anchor's just pulling up and down off the bottom. Uh, so I drop that front anchor, let out plenty of line, uh, you know, back up it, it pretty much is as far as I can. And uh, then I'll drop my two rear anchors and pull back up almost in the middle of my front anchor and my two rear anchors. And that'll give me a nice angle on all the anchors and you know, really hold me even in 15 or 20 mile per hour winds and usually get the job done. Um, so, you know, as far as I was saying about the drift sock, helping with uh, anchoring, somewhere like the James River, um, you can save yourself a little bit of trouble uh, by putting that front anchor out and then just throwing the drift sock off the back with that current constantly moving. It's gonna pull that drift sock and keep it open <coughs> and it's gonna pull the back of the boat straight. Um, you know, that's, it saves you some work, it's a little bit easier to deal with, and then most importantly, it's a lot easier to pull that drift sock up if you get a big fish on, you know, and it's getting close to the back of the boat. Uh, I've lost a couple good fish from the anchor line in, in uh, Lake Jasmine, uh, from not being able to get it out of the way quick enough, but sometimes it's just, uh, just how it goes, you know, uh, it's not really much you can do about it, but in the river, if you can get away with using a drift sock as a rear anchor, and do that, and it might save you, uh, save you a trophy fish. Uh, as far as how I have my boat set up, um, you know, obviously I can't pull my boat in here and show you. But the, the main thing I, you know, I'd like to stress is set up uh, your boat with good rod holders if you're going to get into trophy cat fishing. There's been a lot of people that have had, you know, nice expensive rod and reel combos just pulled completely off the boat. Uh, whether it be from a, a cheap rod holder, you know, plastic, uh, not very high quality, or just not having any at all and laying the rod down. Uh, I know several people personally that that's happened to. And nobody wants to see, you know, $100, $200 rod and reel flying across the water. <laughs> so that's the main thing is just finding some good rod holders. Uh, companies such as Drift Masters, uh, Monster Rod Holders, and Fish Bite Rod Holders. Anything high quality is sturdy to get the job done. Uh, I personally have 16 of them on my boat. Uh, being that it's a 21-foot boat, you know, I can I can spread out 16 rod holders fairly easily. And a lot of times I'm not fishing with 16 rods at once. If I'm if I'm drift fishing, I may use uh, five, six, uh, at the most eight rods. But the reason the rod holders I have so many is just so I can spread out my lines, you know, as best as possible. So uh, you know, sometimes um, if I'm anchor fishing. 
I might throw out 16. But that'll be if I'm anchored in a huge area on the lake and you're just really need to cover a lot of water. For some reason, the fish aren't biting drifting. Uh, so you know, I had to anchor fish. Then I'm putting the odds back in my favor by spreading out as many lines as I can since I'm not moving and uh, covering water the same as I would if I was trolling. Uh, that pretty much covers you know, how I do things. I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. You ever use the, uh, the float on the river? I mean, it seems to me you use them a lot on the lake, yeah, but yeah, mean, the float, how would you go about using them, say, on the jams? The floats are, you know, they work really well on the river, too. Um, I personally use them in the Chowan River, which mm -hmm. is where I'm from. It, you know, it's got some pretty good-sized blue cats, mm -hmm. um, but I caught my biggest blue cat out of that river on a slick bobber. Uh, what I was doing was I was anchored upstream of a lot of... Uh, you know, timber on the bottom, there's a lot of structure, and it was a place where I knew if I, I cast a bottom rig in there, you know, if I did get a fish, it was just gonna run straight in there before I could do anything. So what I did, I, I put a live uh, bluegill on that bobber, and I anchored upstream from that hole that had the submerged timber, and I floated the bluegill suspended over top of that structure, and uh, you know, I had to lock down the drag pretty tight. As soon as the fish grabbed it, you know, I went ahead and got them away from that structure. But uh, I could have done that without using a slip bobber. It would have, I probably wouldn't have even had a chance to, to get a bite from the fish mm -hmm. because I wasn't just casting right in the snag. Uh, so in the river, if there's somewhere you've been looking at that you think might be a really good spot, but maybe you're unsure about throwing out, you know, bottom rigs into it um, and having so much structure, you can anchor upstream of it and just let the current just float that bobber down. These, Three-inch uh, slip forks, they can handle a lot of a lot of weight. Um, I mean, I've had six ounces on them and a big piece of bait, and they still are floating. They're still a little farther down in water, but they'll hold it up. So, uh, yeah, that's one way I use them in the river. Um, if you can find also like maybe an eddy, you know, where you're in the turnover. Yeah, I know river, exactly what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> you can float that slip bobber down in that eddy and uh -huh. just kind of circle around like that. And that's super effective as well. You know what um, I'm talking about? Yeah. I've even caught a lot of fish behind tail races, you know, bank fishing, mm -hmm. uh, by using the slip bobbers to just, to, to get it way out. I let the current, you know, take it way out and then get it in an eddy right by the dam and just let it rotate around like that. Whereas if I was throwing a bottom rig out, the current would just take that line and just pull it right yep. down. So. Yeah, we know a lot of spots like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. With them, with them What is the best time of the year for catfish in a catfish? Um, I don't know if I could say there's uh, one particular best time. I guess, uh, you know, if I did have to pick a time, I'd say probably December or January, just because with the water cooling down, uh, everything is schooling up more in deeper water. Uh, but at the same time, you know, all year round, uh, I usually can find some pretty good fish and, and do pretty well. It's just a matter of um, following the different patterns. You know, in the spring and fall, they're generally you're going to find fish in shallower water. Um, but drift fishing, I, I just think it's a huge advantage fishing a large reservoir. Covering that much water, if you have good rigs, good bait, and cover enough water, it's just the odds are you're going to put your bait in front of some feeding fish and catch some fish. Send it to us, too. Well, if nobody else has any questions, I'm going to head back over to my booth. Uh, if you guys do have anything you want to talk about or think of anything else you want to ask me, feel free to come over there. I'd be happy to help in any way I can. I appreciate it. All right, thank you.